I'd like to introduce the illustrious host of our Power Networking event. She is an amazing woman, an attorney, an author, an advocate for women and diversity, a TV personality, a well-respected businesswoman, a true inspiration to us all, the president of Professional Diversity Network and the National Association of Professional Women, please help me welcome Star Jones. everyone. What a nice reception this is and what a beautiful location. I'm so happy to be home. I think you all know this is my university. You see my U of H uh, pin right here. Cougar, hey. I was here during the time of five slamma jamma babies. This was for real U of H and I am an alumna of the uh, University of Houston's Law Center and I just had the wonderful opportunity of addressing the Law Center's pipeline candidates, which is focused on diversity and making sure that women and people of color uh, feel welcome as a part of the Law Center's um, new student body. And so I was happy to talk to these young students to tell them of my experience here at U of H. So I just want to say welcome to uh, NAPW members. How many people are NAPW members in the room? Let me see your hands. Fantastic. What about NAPW member guests? Who came with an NAPW member? That's fantastic. And then guests of the University of Houston. How many people are guests of the University of Houston? Fantastic. I am so glad to be back here, invited on campus to partner with U of H. Um, I'm going back about now 30 years. I realize I am old, <laughs> but that's okay. Black don't crack, it's all right. <laughs> I was 21 when I entered law school, just beginning to scratch the surface of my life and career. And three years of complete hell later, <laughs> and about $70,000 in student loans, not just from the law school, but combined with my college and law school, um, I graduated and went on and passed the bar on the first time. It was hard work, but it was well worth it. And without a question, my legal education at the University of Houston's Law Center really is what controlled my trajectory my entire professional career. And for that, I am eternally grateful. There is absolutely nothing that I would have been able to accomplish without this law degree, which really and truly um, is the theme of my month with NAPW. Actually, my blog came out on Monday about continuing education because I believe that education is power. Um, it is the foundation for everything that you want to accomplish personally and professionally. And with a legal education, it can really open up a myriad of dreams, and I know this because I absolutely lived it. There's no way in the world that a girl born in North Carolina uh, in a small town, Baden, North Carolina. We were so small, we didn't have a 7-Eleven, we had a 6-10, that's how small <laughs> we were. And then raised in housing projects in New Jersey um, that I was supposed to have the career trajectory that I've had, but um, my family and I, we never listened to other people's expectations, we just decided to go for it. Um, and I'd like to tell you that I look at continuing education as a lifelong learning philosophy, just um, a commitment to enlighten, to enrich, and to empower yourself always. And so you should never stop learning. If you don't go back to get a higher degree, you can go back and, and update your skill set. And anytime you think you've learned it all, then it's time to learn something else. So I want to kick this power networking event off with a charge to you uh, this year, learn a new skill, uh, increase and enhance your education, and when we see each other the next time, you have to fill me in on where you are in your career trajectory. So before I start, I do want to bring you up to date on what has been happening with NAPW. 
Um, and 2015, it was our year of power. I'm just going to give you just a couple of highlights for those of you who are not familiar with NAPW. Uh, we changed our leadership and slowly but surely making some really wonderful incremental changes. It's been a tremendous year of growth. Membership grew to more than 850,000 members across the country. We hosted, planned, and executed over 1,100 separate local events across the country in 2015 only. We added 18 new corporate sponsors, and NAPW and the local chapters raised tens of thousands of dollars for our NAPW Foundation, which of course um, benefits the Breast Cancer Research F Fund, the American Heart Association, Dress for Success, and Girls Incorporated. We are really seeing more engagement at our more than 200 local chapters, and the pride of my heart, our virtual e-chapter, which is the virtual networking chapter, has now grown to 17,000 members. It's unreal. It's a really amazing accomplishment. And obviously, that makes it our largest chapter and our most active chapter. And I, I always ask them to update these numbers for me. Um, in the last eight months, we have had actual engagement of participation of more than 5,000 women on our virtual e-chapter meetings. It's just unbelievable what we've been able to accomplish. And yes, I've joined from all over the place. I'm going to join. We have an e-chapter tomorrow, as a matter of fact, and I'll be in Miami hosting the um, uh, American Black Film Festival from Miami. But I have hosted from the back of a car on the way to the airport, from the airport lounge, in our Chicago office, in our LA office. I have um, uh, even hosted from Disney World with Minnie Mouse ears on, because I had my new stepson for spring break, and you know, you gotta do what you gotta do when you're a new mama. I hosted from the Kentucky Derby weekend um, in a really fly hat, I must say. And um, I even hosted from a boat in the middle of the Caribbean. Um, I hosted from my sick bed with no makeup and my hair in a ponytail and a runny nose. So um, we've now started playing the game, where in the world is Star? Um, so it's really a lot of fun. I love the engagement more than anything because I believe in the power of networking and you can network anywhere in any environment. You have the opportunity to meet and greet new women because it has always been a part of my career. It has always been a part of my professional life. All the way from law school, I came here to the University of Houston because U of H at the time housed the College of District Attorneys. And I knew that given the opportunity, I would have the um, uh, opportunity to walk in to a room where district attorneys were from all over the country. And that's what I wanted to do. So I met the DA from Florida and from Chicago and from New York City and from Brooklyn and Los Angeles, and I got offers from all of them. And I took the job in Brooklyn because that was really where I wanted to be. Um, and same thing when I went to the district attorney's office, uh, power of networking got me my first job on television. My office mate, Suzanne, got a call from her husband who um, told her about a new TV network that was starting up called Court TV. And <clears throat> he said that they wanted a prosecutor to come in and do some commentary. Well, she had the phone on speaker, one of those old fashioned speaker phones that were connected, you know, this, it was actually a big old box that was connected to the phone. And she said words that would change my, my life. She said, I'm not that vain, ask Star. <laughs> Clearly, I was that vain, and um, I stepped into my new reality. I became um, a part-time, unpaid commentator for Court TV, and then that was in July 1991, and by December 1991, I was uh, doing it every evening from 7 to 9 p.m. until NBC saw me and offered me the position of chief legal correspondent for NBC News. So it was just an amazing trajectory, but none of it would have been possible 
without the law degree. None of it would have been possible about the networking opportunity with my girlfriend, my colleague, Suzanne, at my office, and I've always paid it back. Um, you know, when I moved into other aspects of television, again, it's the power of networking. Um, I remember very distinctly after my coverage of the O.J. Simpson trials, the criminal trial, the civil trial, and even the child custody trial, I was just at a crossroads, not knowing where I wanted to go next, what I wanted to do, and I got a phone call in my office uh, out in Los Angeles at the time, and it was a young man who said, I don't know if you will remember me, my name is James, I used to work for a particular talk show host, um, and I remembered immediately, and uh, he said, um, uh, and I, I, I started asking him, how are you doing? I remember you were a production assistant and you had these ideas about what kind of work you wanted to do and what you wanted to produce. And so I started chattering away and I said, so how's it going? He says, it's going really well. I'm no longer a production assistant. I am actually a producer for Barwall Productions, Barbara Walters' company. And she's created a new show that I think you'd be perfect for. I've submitted your name. Do you think you could come in for the audition? I went in for the audition, got the job on the spot, and thus I became a co-host on The View for the next nine years. It was the power of networking because I was nice to this young man and I was interested in what he was doing and I cared about what his career trajectory was. And so that stuck with him and he came back years later when he was in a position to give it back, he gave it back. So that's a life lesson. One, be ready, prepared. When the opportunity knocks on your door, when opportunity meets preparation, there's nothing that you can't do. That's number one. Number two, pick up the phone, all right? If there's a phone call that comes, it could be an opportunity on the other end. And number three, be careful of the feet you step on today because they may be connected to the behind. You will kiss tomorrow, okay? <laughs> I'm always nice to everybody that I work with and work for because you're going to always run back in into them. That's networking. That's the power of networking. We uh, do our national networking series across the country. We do these regional power networking events. And we really and truly exist only um, to elevate women and your success. Um, it's not uh, the kind of organization where you have to show up a whole lot of times, but you show up when you want to, when you're looking to advance your own success and when you're looking to help another woman advance hers. So that's what we're doing today, which brings me to a new part of our segment for our, our Power Network events, the power of one. Um, this segment actually highlights professional women who are achieving their career goals and making a tremendous impact on a local and national level. So I'd like to introduce you to our first panelist, Victoria Aylin Bryant, has more than 17 years of pharmacy experience in community, long-term care, consulting, and hospital settings. In 2003, Dr. Bryant founded Ambassadors Caregivers, a home care agency that serves seniors, the disabled, and elderly population in the greater Houston area. In 2010, she created Senior Vantage, an online senior housing search engine for the Houston metropolitan area. And more recently, she established Ambassadors Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to promoting wellness and independence for seniors. In addition to her entrepreneurial accomplishments, Dr. Bryant is a prominent community leader who serves on several boards and committees. She's currently serving as president of the World of Chamber of Commerce of Texas and has shown a strong passion and dedication in giving back to the community through volunteerism and humanitarian relief efforts. Please give a big round of applause and welcome to Victoria Aylin Bryant to the stage. It's great to have you here with us today. Sit down. Wonderful. Okay, you're a girl after my own heart. Fabulous shoes that starts it all out. <laughs> Wonderful. So, Dr. Bryant, did you did the medical field always appeal to you? Like I knew that the law was my calling. Did you know it was medicine for you? 
I did not um, start out. I was just a typical student who didn't really know what she wanted to do in life. And I'm sure that echoes with a lot of students, uh, you know, going through school. Um, but I actually wanted to be a fashion designer. Hence um, the red shoes. <laughs> that's right. And that's still in my blood. Um, but uh, a tragedy happened in my family, and so I redirected um, my career to stay here in Houston to help my family. And I have not regretted uh, that part, um, and it's led me to where I am today. You know, that's interesting that um, something that could have derailed you on your professional um, trajectory, you used it as a way to change the trajectory and to still achieve. Yes, I think it's um, important. It was important for me at the time to support my mother, mm -hmm. who had, I have four other brothers, and I was really their mother at the time. And so using that um, and continuing to do what I want to do in life, and I wanted to succeed, I wanted my brothers to succeed, because I know that if I finish college, they will finish college. If I had a great career, they will also follow. And I always believed that I had to lead my family where, um, you know, I wanted them to be later on in life. Um, and so that, you know, my parents were always very giving to other people. Even though I had four brothers, I really had a bunch more in the house. They took in a lot of kids while we were growing up, and I was grateful for that, just to see their compassion for other people. Well, it seems as if in some ways, Although you were a sibling, you played the role of mentor um, to your younger siblings. And so now you've been an entrepreneur, a pharmacist, an expert in the field of elder care. Did you have your role mentors in each of these fields that helped you launch what you wanted to do? Yes, um, I really believe that it's important to have mentors and also to mentor someone. The reason I'm here today, uh, I'm very grateful, is because of someone I mentor. And so, um, and I do, um, and I think it's important for us to sit and not just um, chat all the time, but observe people who are in leadership mm -hmm. and see why they're so successful. I mean, just look at Star, you know, and see why the people who are successful, where, you know, where they are um, at that point in their life and how you, you know, you, your path and their path are not the same, but where is it or how is it that you can learn from them to pave your own path? Well, I'm about to learn from you because you've done a lot of great work in elder care as I have introduced to the audience today. Um, I was fascinated and I think because a number of us in this room probably have um, elderly parents or grandparents and um, we are, um, you know, closer to one end of the spectrum than the other end of the spectrum, at least I am and I understand that. So I really want to know what makes ambassador caregivers and senior vantage those unique products? What makes those stand out from other products that serve the elderly? Because these are things that more and more uh, of our country is going to need. Um, I, uh, first of all, I want to say that I love seniors and I've been in this business for a long time. Even before I had my company, I worked at the VA hospital. That was my first and last job. And the reason that I'm in this industry is because, you know, we, we highlight the young folks, we highlight models, we highlight those who uh, are, you know, healthy, but sometimes we forget about the elderly. Um, and so my company, I'm first a pharmacist, and as clinicians, if you're a nurse in here, you know, if you're a doctor, you probably understand too that we're first clinicians before we're business people. Mm -hmm. And so the, the company that I established is exactly that. You know, we care for them as our own parents. And we also took an oath, just like in law you took an oath. Um, we also take an oath to really um, care for the elderly, you know, with ethics, with our ethics, um, to do the right thing, to treat them right with dignity and respect. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that's important to us. And we also, um, teach a lot in the community. We go out and we teach seniors. We teach, uh, uh, you know, at churches, at communities. And that's the other thing that we do too. We don't just uh, take care of you and not let you know what's going on, but we also go out there in the community and teach and do health fairs, uh, health events, screenings, so that seniors can stay healthy. You know, it's interesting, um, as I read your bio, 
I love learning about your business, but I also love learning about your missionary work. I understand you've taken 10, over 10 mission trips to between Vietnam and Brazil. Um, so I ha have your experiences as a missionary shaped the way you interact with seniors and with other members of our community because missionary work is God's work. Yes, um, I took my first medical missionary trip when I was still a student, a pharmacy student. And that was really the reason why I got into the business that I got into. And, you know, it's all about perspective in life. You know, I think I have a lot of problems, you know, growing up and my father passing away. It's a lot of problems, right, that we think we have. But when you go on a medical missionary trip, it will change your life because your problems are minute to the problems they have. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're drinking a glass of water and they drink after you, because that water is better than the water they have, mm -hmm. it's heartbreaking. And so I do missionary work. Uh, really, it's, it's really for me to keep perspective of what life is really about and the things that you do, the hardship that you go through as a businesswoman, as a mother, uh, as a child, as a you know, grandmother. It's minute to the rest of the world and what they're having to deal with. You know, it's so interesting. I have some friends who... Uh, started an organization that brings electricity um, to remote villages um, throughout Africa. And I did not fully appreciate what that work was until she explained to me that uh, a woman who is pregnant will start walking two days ahead of time um, before she's yeah. supposed to give birth so that she can be in a place that has some light because if she should go into labor and there's no electricity in the four, five, seven, ten 10 miles wow. from where she lives to where there's any medical attention, she would be alone in the dark. And just the, the thought that we walk into our own homes and flip a, a light switch or press a button without ever even thinking about it. And so I completely understand and I just applaud you for the work that you do in that way. Um, Dr. Bryant, you're very active in events and conferences based around the Vietnamese culture. Um, and that is absolutely something that we all need to, especially in these days and times, embrace the wonderful cultural fabric that we bring to the United States of America. What have you brought from your culture that you brought into your work and your community activism? Mm -hmm. um, I actually only got back into my community about seven years ago. And shame on me that I didn't do it earlier. But I found that it's important, you know, as diverse as the city of Houston is, there's so much culture here that we can get involved in, even with each other. Uh, and then, you know, the networking that you guys have here, it's, it's tremendous. Uh, networking and culture opportunities and we need to learn because you don't want to be ignorant going out there and not knowing what other cultures are doing and I actually right now am having to deal with the Jewish culture because we have Jewish clients and uh, you know and what I'm doing now is bringing in a someone who's an expert in that into my office to teach our caregivers how to care for a Jewish person not only that but we're diversifying our employees to make sure that they cover every ethnicity, Fantastic. especially for this, uh, for this city, uh, for this, you know, town. Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, I feel that it's really important. I've, I've done many things uh, in the community for the community. Um, and then it was the point where they said, oh, you're doing it for your own benefit. And then they realized, no, I'm doing it because I love them and I want to be a part of it. Um, and so even like this coming November, I'm doing a fashion show and bringing out eight, ten designers who are Vietnamese and letting them showcase their designs. Fantastic. Just to, to have that part of the culture in the city. And you're still keeping in with your fashion design. I have to. I have to. It's in your head. <laughs> now, before we go and move on, I really would appreciate if you would share ways that you take initiative to self-educate and keep current with the news and with developments in your industry because as I started out today, I said continuing education, um, shoring up your skill set, and always learning. Um, 
uh, there's a saying, always be learning something. And what are you always learning? I'm definitely always learning something, just like you said. Um, right now, I'm taking a leadership uh, uh, you know, class. It's called American Leadership Forum. I've, I've been through Leadership Houston, and it's important to me to continue to learn. And number one, because I don't know everything. Uh, and as well as in my industry, you know, going to conferences and making sure that I, if there's something that, that I'm weak at, which I'm weak at a lot of things, go and learn it and don't be afraid. Um, so, you know, every year I do conferences uh, to go there just to learn but also to give back because a lot of times, you know, we, we, we take so much in from others and we need to go and be able to give those back too. Fantastic. Dr. Bryant, I have enjoyed our conversation. She is evidence of the power of one. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you so very Thank much. You. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Somebody that's such an inspiration and really has stood in the space that God has created for her. Let's give Dr. Bryant another round of applause. Our next panelist really needs no introduction to some of you. Sandra Tennessee has been the Associate Dean for Student Affairs at the University of Houston's Law Center since 2005. Sandra oversees registration, scholarships, and financial aid diversity programs, student counseling and advising, study abroad programs, and graduate programs. In addition, she works strategically with admissions, career development, and alumni relations. Prior to assuming her current position, Sandra served as the assistant dean for admissions at the UH Law Center. She also worked at the University of Oklahoma's College of Law and Washington University School of Law, and serves in leadership positions in several organizations, including the American Bar Association, the Law School Admissions Council, and currently is serving as the chair of the section for part-time education with the Association of American Law Schools. She's also a SARA. <laughs> She's a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, which means my sorority sister. Thank you so very much, and help me welcome Dean Sandra Tennessee to the stage. SARA Tennessee. I'm so glad that you're here. <laughs> yes, and you see I have the pink right here. No matter what, we always turn into 17-year-olds when we start talking <laughs> about the sorority. So, actually, you were one of the first people that I saw when I first came back here. I, I brought in my, my young goddaughter to have her come and experience the University of Houston School of Law. Did you, and she knew she wanted to be here, so I got her right here at the university, I'm so proud of her. Did you always know that you wanted to practice law? You know I did. Well, I knew from about 10 years old. I'm an only child, and for any people who are only children, you're always to blame. <laughs> if anything yeah. is torn up, missing, etc., it's your fault. It usually was, though. No, it was not. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to defend myself, as my dad had blame me for something and I've put together the evidence, I've made my case, and we realized that it was him and not me. Oh. And at that point, I realized that I need to advocate for myself, and they said, you're a little Perry Mason. And that was go. it. That was it. Sorry so, for those who don't know Perry Mason. <laughs> <laughs> you, the, you're, the, you seem to have a passion for law, but you use that passion for law and brought education into it. How did you marry the two? So, I wanted to go to law school and I was going to be a corporate lawyer. However, I didn't know what a corporate lawyer really did, mm -hmm. nor did I try to find out. I just said that's what I was going to do. And I think when I listen to your story, that is the difference because we have to explore, what, what are we saying we want to do? Mm -hmm. And when I came home from school, I would have to go to the neighbors up the street because I was a latchkey kid. And the great grandmother in the house would always say, Sonia, because they never could say my name right, ever. Sonia, you gonna be a teacher? I was like, no ma'am. But I ended up in education. Mm -hmm. And the way I ended up in this position is totally by happenstance. I was in law school 
and I always helped with tours and doing their open houses, and shockingly, I was a panelist for the student uh, event. Well, their assistant director for admissions had gotten married and moved away in January, and that is the crunch time for admissions. And myself, being a third year law student with lots of information and skill, offered my services to the Dean of Admissions for a small fee. <laughs> it never occurred to me to do it for free, right? I'm just trying to, you know, get mine, right? Smart. And um, so he said, oh, well, this is interesting. Well, he knew me. And so this was developing a relationship that I didn't know would actually have monetary benefits in later my first job. And so I really had a passion for always working with people, connecting them to things that they were interested in, and now I could get paid to do that and travel on my law school's dime. That was a pretty cool gig. You know what my father said? Find something you'd love to do and figure out how to get paid for it. That's exactly what you did. You've actually been a powerful presence here at the University of Houston for the past 20 years. So I imagine you've seen firsthand how education and the law has changed with, tech, with the advances in technology um, and, um, uh, and the media. Um, so do you believe that students are learning differently and how do you think it will impact on America's future lawyers? So first thinking mm -hmm. about how students are learning, how they're receiving information. Of course technology changes. If people could look up for five minutes and engage with each other, that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, we are in our own worlds. And honestly, we all do it at some point where we're all looking at our devices and we're not aware of what is around us. I've seen women literally walk into a pillar outside because they were texting and walk straight into a column because they were not paying attention. And you have to be aware because I think so often you can miss those opportunities because you're just not aware of your surroundings. A young man came to my office today to thank me because he had been sick during exams and he was just really thankful that we helped him and uh, permitted him to take his exams later. In law school, you usually have one exam at the end of the semester. And so if, if you're not able to take that exam, you don't finish the class. But we were able to work with him. Well, he shared with me that he would go to class 20 minutes early because it was right after another class, and so he'd just go to the classroom. How many of us do that and take the time to just spend in a quiet space? Mm -hmm. Well, his professor did also, and she was an adjunct. They began to form a bond, and from that, he was able to get a clerkship through networking with her. The power of networking. And so, with, with education and with technology, we just miss out on those opportunities. Mm -hmm. It would have been very easy for him to go to the student commons, text on his phone, play some Angry Birds, play words with friends, and then go to the class five minutes before. But 20 minutes changed his opportunity. Who knew? Fantastic. That is really fantastic. And I, similar to me asking Dr. Bryant, I know that you work with and mentor a wide range of prospective students who are considering applying to law school. I just uh, told everybody about mm -hmm. the pipeline program mm -hmm. that we both participated in upstairs. From undergrads um, going directly into law school to seasoned professionals who are transitioning to a new career. We met a uh, young lady in your program who works uh, in media and now she wants to work in law. She's the absolute opposite of me. So what um, advice do you have for anyone interested in pursuing a law degree? Uh, you know, you and I have talked about this several times, it's always my feeling that the law degree gives you entree to a world beyond measure. I'm curious about how you feel about it. That is a great question. I think, first of all, people have to think about why they want to go to law school or pursue whatever it is, but we're talking about law. I should have brought some applications. Oh, wait, they're online. <laughs> you have to think about what you're seeking. Some people do things just for the title, right? Let me get some more letters behind my name. 
but they don't really have a goal that they want to achieve with that. And so the first thing I would say is why you're going. Law school today is expensive. Mm -hmm. Even at University of Houston, at the state rate, is it, it's expensive. To have $70,000 of loans with undergrad and law school would be a luxury for some. Right. We just looked at some applications for students to receive scholarships for taking the bar exam. $150,000 was not uncommon to see. And so when you're thinking about what you're going to do, more so than ever, you have to think about what do I want to do with this? Now, our Assistant Dean for Career Services is in the room, and she has the very difficult task of helping people navigate that career. What I have discovered is that regardless of where you are in your graduating class grade-wise, whether you're at the bottom or at the top, people are more successful if they have an idea of what they're interested in. Because then you're able to target your very limited resource, mm -hmm. which is time. If you say you'll do anything, what is anything? There's not a job in anything. You can't network in everything. But if you at least have a target, wah, <laughs> stuff flying up here, Texas. If you at least have a target, then you will be in a space that you at least have some interest in and you're not just running after everything that comes by because that doesn't show that you have a passion. And from there, that could lead you to something else, but you at least start in a more targeted way. And let me just be practical because we're talking a little bit of money. You, in order to, you, you, as you pointed out, a legal education can, can be expensive, mm -hmm. but whatever you pursue for continuing education, if you're going for a higher degree, that can be expensive. Mm -hmm. Since we have the brain trust here, the person who actually helps people with their financial aid, give us some ideas of some resources that women can use for their own continuing education. Well, sure. You know, there are some outside scholarships, and people don't tap into those. But there, there are resources that you can look at. So fastweb.com is a place where there's a huge consolidation of scholarships. Now, the key to applying to scholarships, and this is going to be wild, what I'm going to say, give the people what they're asking for. Mm -hmm. That's crazy, right? But for whatever reason, people just decide, I'm going to write this essay. It has nothing to do with what the folks are asking for. That means that you need to tailor your information. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you should do, and this is very important in networking in general, what is your elevator speech? Mm -hmm. And you have to share what your interests are, because you never know who you're talking to. One of the young men in the pipeline program ended up in my office. He's an undergraduate here. And I'm thinking, OK, now, how did you find me? Well, his daddy told him he should talk to somebody in the law school. Well, that was a check for me that he listened to his daddy. I think you should listen uh -huh. to your daddy. Very mannerable. We talked about law school. I found out that he was a sophomore. Again, how did he find He used his resources. Mm -hmm. In the big World Wide Web of U of H, my law students can't find me, but this guy way across campus found me. And so I told him about the pipeline program. And then I told the people, when he applies, y'all need to let him in the program, because if he can find me, he can find other resources, and he can be a very good advocate for others. So sharing your story and making sure you connect with those opportunities. And number three, don't think that you can't do it. So you might be headed towards one direction, but it'll take you in a different direction that still gets you to your ultimate goal. 100%. You know, as I was sitting here thinking, we're talking higher education in terms of degree programs, but there are a lot of other continuing education programs that are out there. I know NAPW specifically uh, partners with Star 12, which are webinars and seminars that can help you up your skill set in any particular area. If you're interested in human resources or interested in education or interested in uh, one of the other technology 
um, careers or uh, just want to learn how to use your computer products and, and make it more advantageous. Those kind of continuing education opportunities are extremely smart and you can take one of those classes at your own leisure because anytime you can increase your skill set, you increase your opportunity. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. And we have leisure learning mm -hmm. here from Houstonians. There's so many wonderful things in leisure learning and they're relatively inexpensive in comparison to what you might pay in the open market. Um, Dr. Jesse, would you please tell me and tell us, um, as you look at, across the landscape, women professionals, what's the best piece of advice you can give to a woman professional who is transitioning to a new phase um, of her uh, professional career? She doesn't know exactly what's next, but she knows something is next. A book that I really like is called, I think, is Strength Finder. And Strength Finder, if anybody's ever done, I love assessments. Maybe it's because I'm in education, but I love assessments. Strength Finder helps you analyze and assess your top strengths. And if you have additional money, you can analyze, I think it's like 26 or 30 strengths. And what this book tells us is that we should really play to our strengths, not to our weaknesses. And certainly we have to do some things that we're not as good at, but oftentimes people will use a lot of energy trying to shore up those weaknesses and not really focus on the strengths. Mm -hmm. So for a person who is transitioning, I would say really assess what your strengths are and continue to build those and look for things that will allow you to excel by using those strengths. Recognize your weaknesses and figure out how you have to use those in that position. But if you can be in a position where you're able to use your strengths more, you will be happier, you will shine, you will be noticed, and your employer will love you. Um, sounds like you're saying use what you got. Hey. Use what you got. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dean. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. you. Dean, thank you for that wonderful advice. Thank you. I just love listening to smart women tell us exactly what we need to do to sort of move ourselves forward. I want to thank Dean Tennessee one more time, if you could give them a round of applause, and to Dr. Bryant for sharing their experiences, advice, and wisdom. Obviously, you both are an inspiration for what you do and my very best um, in your efforts to empower others. That's what we are here for. Um, and now, I want you to do what you came here to do, which is network. Uh, it's very, very important. You have to work your network. And I want you to remember, as you listen to some of the advice today, networking is really all about relationships. It really has the power to change your life, and as you listen, to both our Power of One speakers talk, and I hope in some words that maybe I have shared with you, we've tried to impart to you that the key to attaining your goals through networking is to take those relationships and build upon them over time. It's not just what somebody can do for you, it's what you can do for them also. It is a beautiful give and take um, that creates, in my opinion, that ultimate connection. And that's what our goal is at NAPW, to take power networking to another level and allow it really to do, inure to the benefit of the women of NAPW. Don't forget to join me for Photos for Philanthropy. I'm not sure if the ladies have talked to you about this. Uh, I'm going to be standing out there taking some photographs. Um, I know some of you have registered for $20. We are going to take a formal picture that you will have in three days um, that you can use uh, in any way you want, but all the money, every dollar, goes to the NAPW Foundation, which will benefit Breast Cancer Research Foundation, uh, the American Heart Association, Dress for Success, and Girls Incorporated. So if, in fact, uh, you want to take a photograph, I'd love to get a chance to personally say hello to you. 
I want to thank the University of Houston's Law Center for partnering with me and with NAPW to bring me home and to bring the ladies of NAPW and our guests in here today. So thank you all very much. I'm going to turn it back over to Edna, and uh, she is going to do some network wrap up, and I am going to position myself out there and strike a pose, as they say. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>